So our first speaker today, Jack Breed, is probably well known to most of you. And uh, what we wanted when we uh, invited Jack was to get someone that was a visionary, someone that was uh, bold enough to say, I think in the future this is what we're going to have. I only few people have, are brave enough to say that because uh, they might be proven wrong. But Jack has been doing this exercise and has been providing the reasons why he thinks some of the uh, changes in the industry are going to happen. And he tries to picture what the industry will look like in a few years to come. He was uh, talking about 50 years. We tell, well, just tell us about 10 years will be good enough for us. <laughs> But Jack accepted, and uh, I was very uh, uh, grateful to, to be here with us today. So I would like to invite you, I would like to ask you to give a, a good hand of applause to, to Jack. Good morning, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. As the pilot said yesterday, we're going to have a little turbulence ahead, so you want to tighten your seat belts. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, the slides that I'll be presenting this morning are free for any of you to use, borrow, steal, however you'd like to have them. I'll be happy to send them to you or post them on the website. If you look at the slides, we're going to have numbers on them. That's to keep me on target and to let you know what we're going to be talking about. The first number here is number one, and that's the first thing I'm going to talk about on the slide. I just want to recognize a group of people around the world who have been working with me over the last four and a half years as we've put together this vision for the future in terms of predicting what the dairy industry is going to be like in the next 50 years. I was asked to give an endowed lecture at Michigan State University. Usually they let you talk about whatever you want to talk about, and then they told me we want you to talk about the dairy industry in Michigan 50 years from now. And that's when I recruited these colleagues from across the U.S. and Europe, and we interact still almost on a daily basis. And we, this, the slides have changed a lot over the last three years, and so uh, stay with us. We're going to go through lots of data real quickly. I want to start out with a big picture look because that's important. The United States has only about 3.3 percent of the dairy cows in the world. And so there's a lot of cows out there and a lot of opportunities, I think, if we have a vision for that. We built this dairy barn in 1953. We moved to this farm in 1952 in October. We built it in 1953. That happened to be the same time that James Watson and Francis Crick published the structure of DNA. So it may be appropriate to be talking at this meeting since DNA is very important to us. Uh, that's a, that, was one of the, that was a heifer that was born on our farm in our first uh, heifer crop. Uh, she was not registered. We started out with grade cows, we milked grade cows. That picture was taken when she was 10 years of age. She was still in the herd. Uh, she produced 16,990 pounds of milk at eight years of age. That was a high level of production at that time, six or seven standard deviations above the national average. Uh, cows were mostly on pasture, fed alfalfa hay, all the concentrate they could eat in eight or 10 minutes of milking twice a day. And this was a foreign line side open stall barn, so we could milk 18 cows an hour on a good day. So uh, this is the way I got started in the dairy business. So I'm looking back almost 70 years. And so looking ahead 50 years or 10 years is pretty easy. Now, why dairy? Uh, first of all, this study was done by non-agricultural scientists. It was published about three years ago. They looked at how much cropland how many people could the cropland in the United States support and feed using a, a recommended diet down to the amino acid and nutrient level? And they said, what kind of cropping systems and, and feeding systems or food systems could support the most people? What they found, if we, if we followed the NRCS recommendations for land management, class one land, two and three, and so on, we could feed the most people with a dairy-based, plant-based diet combination, the second most people with an egg-based, plant-based combination, and those beat the vegetable or vegan-based diet in all cases. And the reason for that is that you get essential nutrients and vitamins, amino acids from those diets that you don't get from a vegan-based diet. And so that's really why dairy is important not only to us, but to the rest of the world. 
Now, if we look at what's happening in the rest of the world, we're going to see a huge change in population over the next 50 years, even over the next 10 years. But what's really important is if you look at what we might call the developed countries, if you look at Europe, population's going to go down. If you look at Latin America, it's going to increase slightly in the Caribbean. North America may go down depending on what we do with immigration. All of our growth in the last 50 years in the United States has been by immigration. It hasn't been by fertility of our indigenous population. And so if we change immigration, population could grow, go down in the U.S. And, and of course, if you look at the entire world, 92% of the growth in the next 50 years is going to be in Africa and Asia. And 83% of that growth, 82%, is going to be in Africa alone. So when we talk about dairy product marketing and export, that's where the market's going to be. We're not going to see substantial growth in what we might call the de developed world. And there's lots of competition out there among who will supply the food to those people in the areas that don't have sufficient land and resources to feed themselves. There are estimates about how much milk we will need 50 years from now. Uh, and, and that is growing and growing and growing in terms of the change in, in where people live in a country. For example, if you take Nigeria, as people move from the rural area to the city, they earn more money, they have a better job, their milk consumption and dairy consumption goes up sixfold. And that's true essentially across Africa. And the same thing is true in Asia. So we see estimated growth in consumption. Right now the consumption is about 87 kilograms per person per year. Uh, if you don't follow uh, the metric system, it multiply 87 times 2.2, that's about how many pounds of dairy equivalent we're consuming per year. The recent Eat Lancet recommendation for dairy is actually pretty positive. They take it up to 91 kilograms per year. FAO says we ought to be at 119 kilograms per year. That means we're going to have to increase total production in the world by 147 to 191 percent over the next 50 years. That's a lot of extra milk. That's about five times what the United States produces every year in additional demand, the entire United States. So we're going to have substantial growth in demand for milk. Now, how do we get there? Right now, we have about 274 million dairy cows in the world, 274 million dairy cows in the world. If we stay at the same level of production we have today, we're, we would need more than 525 million dairy cows in the world 50 years from now. I mean, that's not sustainable. If we double the average of today, we would have about 262 million, and if we increase one and a quarter percent a year, then we'd be down to 249 million cows to feed the world. One and a quarter percent a year growth in production is actually a pretty substantial growth. And so what we need to figure out is how can we help the world do that? And how can we do that not only here, but using our genetic capabilities around the world? This is kind of a busy graph, but what, what it shows are the countries that have the most cows in the world dairy cows, and the color code that you see is the level of their production. You can see that we have 120 million cows that produce less than 1,700 kilograms a year, or less than 3,500 pounds per year in the world. 120 million cows at that level of production. Uh, that's, that's a real challenge for us worldwide in terms of feeding the population. And those countries are in areas where the population growth is going to be the greatest. And so we have to uh, understand how do we work with those countries and work with those populations uh, to feed the world, to provide the dairy products that they need. These are the countries that produce 75% of the world's milk. And on the left bar, you see the average production per cow and on the red bar, the red bar is the cumulative average yield per cow as we move across these 25% or 75% of the 
of the world's uh, milk production, 20 countries. And you can see the first one is the U.S., where we, we average uh, 23,000 pounds of milk. And then as you add India and Brazil and other countries, notice what happens to the average production. It drops dramatically. And even though you have countries like Germany and uh, PAC, uh, the U.K. and the Netherlands that have high production, the average stays low because so many countries have lower production. And when we get over to the end, the average of the, these top 20 countries is about 3,300 kilos, or about 7,000 pounds per year, 7,500 pounds or so. But the world average is just 2,379 kilos, uh, or 5,000 to 6,000 pounds per year. So we have a real challenge to meet that supply in the future. In the United States, we have a conundrum. We have too much milk. And one of the things that is happening, of course, is that people are consuming dairy as something other than fluid milk. We've consumed more dairy in the last few years than we have for, for several decades. Last year, we consumed seven, or 50, 56 billion pounds of milk as fluid milk, but 159 billion pounds of milk as other products. So we really need to think about what the composition of our milk should be. And in the future, in the next 10 years, what we're going to see is that we're going to see more attention paid to the proteins, the caseins, the whey proteins in milk. The, the, the demand is going to shift, not only from the consumer, but from the processor in terms of yield and products that are being made. I think we will see a, a change in the demand for different fatty acids in milk, not just the percent fat, but the fatty acids. We'll see somatic cell count drop to maybe 200,000 as a maximum for the industry. Uh, processing is going to start looking at what is the best product for ultrafiltration, for UHT, for aseptic packaging. If we're going to sell products overseas, we're going to sell products that are either UHT or aseptically packaged or a processed product. We're not going to be shipping fresh milk, obviously. The U.S. seems to be lagging behind in developing new products. And I, that's one of the concerns to me. We're not as creative and imaginative. We need, to be, we need to have people in Africa and Asia and these countries that are going to be our export markets learning about what kind of products will those consumers want and how do we create them and how do we get the product ready for them. Here's what's happened in the U.S. in the last, uh, since 1995. This is the supply of milk, and the red lines at the bottom are imports. We complain about imports. Imports are insignificant. What you see is that over the last uh, 25 years or so, the U.S. population has grown 22 percent, but milk production has grown 46 percent. So it's not too complicated to understand what the conundrum is. We're producing more milk than our population demands or consumes even though consumption has gone up. And so somehow maybe we need to think about over the next 10 years, how do we get that back into a, a, a more important uh, balance between supply and demand? So I did a calculation. I took the milk production for 2017, maybe 2018. Um, I, did, I did that recently. And I said, what if our standard supply was 4.2% fat, 3.2% protein? What if we quit selling pounds of fat and pounds of protein and sold a composition mix, uh, which essentially would be some sort of formula? If we could reach a 4.2% fat and a 3.2% protein, we would remove 11.7 billion pounds of milk from the U.S. supply. 11.7 billion pounds of milk. That's 156,000 semi-trailer loads. And yet we would meet our components almost perfectly. We would have a slight increase in fat components. We would have a slight decrease in protein components. We would get rid of 568 million pounds of lactose, which is almost worthless in the marketplace. So we're hauling a lot of milk and lactose around that we probably don't need to be producing in terms of volume. 
So that's something for us to think, I think about genetically and as we look to the future. Now, there's no question that milk prices are going to be volatile in the future, just like they have been in the past. We looked at all of the data from New Zealand over the last 25 years, and these are data that published in Horst Dairyman for the U.S. over this period of time. And you can see there's a 70 to 75 percent difference on an inflation-adjusted dollar basis in the price that farmers receive from milk. 60% of the time, farmers were getting prices below the mean, and 40% of the time above the mean. So we need more resilience at the farm level in terms of the volatility that takes place in the market. And dairy is just one of those enterprises where you can increase a whole lot faster than you can decrease in the supply not only here in the United States, but in other parts of the world. So this is an issue, I think, for us to wrestle with as we look in the future. It's pretty hard to really forecast the future because shareholders are interested in next quarter or next year. And only few creative companies are really looking far ahead. So if we have a vision for the future, then I think that's where we'll be. If you think in 1961, when John Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon at the, by the end of this decade, we didn't have a rocket to go to the moon. We did not have a lunar lander. Or we did not have to know how to orbit the moon. We didn't, know how to, we didn't have a space suit and didn't know how to bring someone back from the moon once we got them there. In 1969, I remember Neil Armstrong stepping down that ladder onto the moon. It was the vision that got us there. That's what drove getting us to the moon and back. And so if our dairy industry has a vision for the next 10 years or for the next 50 years, that's where we'll be. If we don't have a vision, it's going to be still volatile and erratic. One of the important things to look at in the future is climate change. And what's been amazing to me is that as we've looked to the future is to really understand what's going on globally. 82% of the people in the world live north of the equator in the northern hemisphere. 81% of the food that's produced in the world is produced north of the equator in the northern hemisphere. And it also, if you look at the northern hemisphere, we have the most, the, the lower density population countries. Canada, Russia, northern China, very northern China. And the climate people say that we're going to have longer growing seasons in those areas as our climate changes. That's really positive in the sense that the growing areas are going to get longer where there's more land available and fewer people. That's, that's a, 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 a thing that we need to consider in terms of the dairy production and in terms of food production for the world in the future. There are lots of things that are happening that allow us to modify climate, particularly warmer climates. Uh, three things that I want to mention. Uh, one is, obviously, we've learned a lot about cooling cows. That needs to be incorporated into our record systems. What's the temperature on the farm? Are we cooling cows? What's the cow's temperature? Lots of fascinating data going on in that area. These three curves show the projected increase in temperature using three climate models for the future. And we're, it's going to go up. It's just a matter of how high it goes over the next few years. The things that are really fascinating to me are the subsurface irrigation systems that are going in that allow us to reduce water use by 80 percent in irrigation, reduce fertilizer use by 50 or 60 percent because you're essentially feeding the root system and not wasting resources. We actually have farmers in North Carolina that are in, the, in some arid areas that are putting that system in. And one of the dairy farmers that I work with who has a 32,000 pound herd average increased his corn yields from 110 bushel average to 280 bushels by putting this system in to 70 of his 350 acres of corn silage. So we're gonna see that technology. The other technology is adding endophytes and microbes to the seeds of plants. This picture on the right there is from Indigo, a company in Boston, that has discovered if you put the right bacteria or microorganisms on the roots, the 
plants are much healthier, particularly in drought situations. They're seeing 20% increases in yield in drought situations in wheat in Kansas on hundreds of acres of land where they're doing these trials. And they've done it with corn, they've done it with soybeans, they've done it with other crops. So we're going to see some changes in cropping systems that are going to be beneficial in, in the future. Uh, I'm not going to say much about this slide, but this is an interesting slide that was published recently in Nature Communication. It tells you what your city is going to be like 50 years in the future or different years in the future. And so you can look at this. For example, uh, number one up there is Edmonton, Alberta will feel like St. Cloud, Minnesota. Now, my lesson on that is if you want to be dairy in 50 years in the, in the future, buy land in Edmonton, Alberta because it's going to be a great place to dairy 50 years in the future. And, and so we see dairying moving north, and particularly into Canada. They're going to have to change their, their system or their quota system if they want to see dairy grow. But it could be the dairy capital of the world in the future, simply because of the change in climate and weather. Uh, if you live in uh, north Florida, it's going to uh, look like uh, Victoria City in Mexico. 50 years in the future. Uh, go to this site, look like that. I mean, all the, site, all the cities in the United States are in here in Canada, so you can look and see what your weather's going to be like. Now, one of the things that big data is talking about, I guess, when we talk about big data, it boils down to this. As an animal scientist, you start out studying the animal, and then the researchers that fund you, or the, the organization that fund you, say that's not detailed enough. So we start looking at the organ. In my case, we looked at the ovary or the uterus or the hypothalamus. And then they say, well, that's not good enough. And we start looking at the cell. And then we finally look at the gene. None of that tells us anything about how herds and why herds differ. And so that's why we need to utilize big data to incorporate all of that noise that's going on among herds to really understand what, how genetics and the environment interplay or interface. And so we need to do a better job of understanding that. That's, that's really a pretty simple, low cost uh, effort. It's simply a matter of monitoring herds that are in a geographic area that have about the same weather and grow about the same crops and have the same environment and find out what are the things that are different that happen in these herds every day in terms of milking cows or cleaning cows or feeding cows. Uh, the time of doing things, the routines, the protocols, to understand what are the important factors that affect differences among herds. And we'd have a whole lot better evaluations if we could understand some of those factors and incorporate them, I think, into our data systems. Uh, we're going to have lots of sensors. We're already seeing a lot of sensors on farms. Uh, this is where putting the data from those sensors into the cloud and sharing that information will really allow us to exploit uh, what's happening on the farm and to understand what's going in the system. I'm not sure exactly how we do that, but the resources to do it are not particularly uh, a challenge. It's getting people to agree to let their data go into the cloud, and I think there are opportunities to, uh, to do that. Um, Two things here that are interesting. On the lower left, you see an arrow. That is a biodegradable chip that you could implant into the udder or into the liver or into the animal to monitor its metabolic status. And since it's biodegradable, it wouldn't have to be removed when the cow went to a harvest to slaughter. Uh, you know, those are the kind of technologies that we're going to see and are already seeing. On the lower right is a new water purification system. I visited Fair Oaks recently. One of their farms is putting this in. 82% of the water used on the dairy will be recycled as potable water with that system. So that's a complete change in the dynamics of the environmental impact of dairy farms. And I think only farms that are large enough to afford these kind of technologies will really be able to produce dairy products in the future because of the size needed, scale needed to, to get to that point. Uh, as, as Gal mentioned, we've got lots of cooperators, and these cooperators need to work together. And, and I think using a, a technology like blockchain, which provides both transparency and confidentiality as it operates, 
would allow us to capture that information, provide the kind of information we need in terms of simply an analyzing data without identifying a specific cow or a specific farm uh, by, ne by necessity in this system. And so that technology coupled with capturing this information could, could add a lot. Uh, I call this open source research. If we did that and we did it collectively and did it together, why would we need any scientific journals? Why can't we just go straight to the iPads and the phones of the people who are going to be the consumers and users of that information? That would really completely change the way we deliver technology and information. There's no reason we can't do that and do that quickly and begin to do that right now. We already do it with our dairy genetic information, genomic information. So why don't we add nutrition and reproduction and all the other things to that in a way that really might, uh, you know, our, our number of users is going down. So why not use a completely new and novel system in delivering information? Um, the other folks are gonna talk about genetics, but you know, our vision is that cows are gonna be gene-based and not breed-based in the future efficient, smaller footprint, environmental footprint, healthier. We need to start including the genome of the microbiome of the cows in doing the analysis. Those microbes are so important, and now we have high-speed sequencing systems that allow us to identify those. That may be as important as knowing the gene of the cow is knowing the genomes of the microbiomes of the cow. Lots of fascinating data in that area. Gene editing may or may not be used. Uh, lots of good stuff happening in that area. Even in uh, humans being treated already with, with, to cure certain diseases. My question is whether we ought to develop lines of cattle rather than breeds of cattle in the future for our global situation. I looked at the global climate zones. There are about four zones that are characteristic of the entire world. So if we took the Holstein breed and the Jersey breed or some other breed and said, okay, we're going to develop a line for this type of zone, a line for that type of zone, we would have a huge market. We would have a global market. We could, we've got 274 million cows. If we had the right kinds of lines to go into those different climates, you know, that might be a reasonable way. That's what the poultry people and the swine people have done. That's what the plant people do. If you buy soybeans in the United States, there's a hundred different varieties from the north to the south. So why not think about lines of dairy cattle that could feed the world? And the Holstein or the Jersey or whatever breed could contribute to this, but that's a way of exploiting the great genetics and the information that we have to help people in other countries to feed people in other countries. Uh, how would you like to have a 274 million cow market for your AI business? I mean, that's really kind of the question that we're asking. The other thing that's important and is really escalating is what we call the epigenetics or the environmental influence on gene expression. This is a slide from uh, Bennett Castle. The, dark, the black on the left hand side are the heritability estimates for a bunch of traits. If you add all, average all those, it's 19% and 81% is over in the environmental area. Uh, you know, when we say environmental, I think we just don't understand what's going on and much of that is actually related to gene action that is being controlled outside of our normal DNA sequence sort of analysis. And so that's where the opportunity rises. I've been reading a lot about what's happening with RNA. It scares you to death about all the kinds of things that can happen after DNA as you go to many, many, many different kinds of RNAs that can regulate things happening in the animal. And so that's going to be an opportunity in the future. I don't know whether we're going to be sequencing RNAs and dairy cattle. It's a challenge to, to do that and to get down to the sort of micro levels. Uh, but there's an opportunity, opportunity to understand that, I think, in the future. Uh, artificial intelligence. I was at Guelph recently. Uh, they've got a new dairy facility. These are some of their calves on the left. They've got two systems there. They've got a milk replacer feeder and a starter feeder that are both controlled by the computer and those systems talk to each other and they have an RFID tag in each calves ear. Those calves 
never have a negative energy day as they transition from milk replacer to starter and then go into a TMR, calf TMR. They were the healthiest calves I think I have ever seen. And so that system makes sure that the calves consume um, the amount of milk and the amount of starter as they transition so they never lose an ounce of growth, so to speak, over that period. And so these kind of technologies, I think, are going to be useful in the future. And it's going to be useful to capture information on those, uh, on those systems. One of the things I don't understand, we spend a lot of money and equipment on dairy farms. How many farms do you know that have a scale that weighs every cow every day as she leaves the parlor or goes from one location to another or every heifer once a week? You know, load sale scales are pretty cheap. And that might be the best information that we could capture in terms of understanding what's going on in the herd. I mean, it tells us about whether the cows are eating or not, whether they're heat stressed or not, whether they're lame or not, whether they're sick or not. And so here's a technology that we ought to be using, probably should have been using a long time, that would be valuable if we incorporated it into our, into our herds. Um, let, me, let me explain sort of in a little bit more detail about how some of these environmental things happen. In 1992, we published a paper which is now referred to as the BRIT hypothesis. It, it's in that box, that graph in the middle upper level. I had a student that did a huge study with Jersey and Holstein cows. We measured everything. Uh, we did not actually look at what was going on in terms of weight change in his study, but we had the data. And so we were doing a lot of energy balance work in the sow. And I said, I'm going to go back and look and see what happened in those cows. And so I had a 72 Holstein cows, and I had body condition scores every day, or every week, excuse me, for the first 10 weeks. And we simply broke them into those that were above or below the mean. And you notice there's two profiles there. There's one profile where the body condition scores are pretty flat all the way across that period of time. There's another one where they drop substantially and then come back up. These cows were bred by AI on detected heat about 83 days postpartum. The conception rates were 62% versus 25%. And we said, what in the world is going on? What would account that? The energy balance at breeding time and the weeks before breeding was almost the same. So it had to be something done that was occurring earlier. So we hypothesized that really the oocyte that forms the egg that is ovulated must have been imprinted or affected environmentally as it started to develop. It turns out it takes about 101 days from the time the resting egg in the ovary is activated until it grows up in the follicle to the point that is ovulated. And so if you take 82 days postpartum and back up, that egg is beginning its development during the transition period when those weight changes were occurring. And so we believe that a lot of events that are happening in the animal today reflect something that actually temporarily was caused by an action weeks or months or maybe even years ago. We know, for example, that if you feed calves to gain more in the first 70 days of life, they will produce more milk in their first lactation. That's a two-year lapse between those kind of events. And so those are epigenetic or environmental effects that we need to understand more clearly, I think. Now, Milo Wiltbank and Paul Fricke at the University of Wisconsin repeated uh, our study 22 years later. <laughs> Except that they had 1,800 cows on two commercial farms. And these cows were all synchronized and bred by timed AI. They monitored body condition scores during the first three weeks after calving. They had cows that lost condition, maintained condition, and gained condition in the first three weeks. And these are the timed AI pregnancy rates. Now, who believes that Holstein cows with an 84% timed AI pregnancy rate are infertile? We, we've been blaming the infertility on, on, on the cow and her high production, when in fact it's probably a metabolic effect on the oocyte that is associated with that. So 
the question becomes, why do cows have to lose weight in the postpartum period? This may be something, again, if we had the weights on cows, that would be useful for us to understand. The Israelis published a paper a uh, year, year and a half, two years ago now. Uh, at, at one of their big research centers, they actually weigh cows three times a day when they leave the parlor, and they've been doing that for 30 years. And so they know the exact weights. And so they started at, with, the, with the oldest cows and just started working their, back, their, their way back. And lo and behold, they found that cows naturally segregated into two groups, those that lost more weight and those that lost less weight. Naturally, they're producing the same amount of milk. And, and you can see that those that lose less weight, the sort of stifle bars, striped bars, also have lower days open, better fertility, better health, producing the same amount of milk. So we've had this idea that we have to have a cow lose a lot of weight. Maybe we don't have to have a cow that loses a lot of weight. Maybe we need to think about in the future having cows that actually have a much more stable weight change around parturition and yet produce the same amount of milk over time. Maybe the peak is not as high, but maybe the persistence is longer. Uh, this, in Switzerland, there's a recent study looking at uh, hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of records of brown Swiss cows sired by different bulls. And they find that some bulls sire what they consider to be more robust cows, cows that milk much higher and stay in the herd much longer. And then they have others who do just the opposite. So we may need to think differently. Now, I don't, I don't know the, st the statistics and the, and the analysis well enough to understand exactly what they did here. Uh, Paul and his team will, will understand that. But, but I think this is the, the thing that we need to think about. Do we need to have the same sort of cow that we have now or can we have something different in the future? that would uh, be healthy and not create some of the transition cow problems that we have today. Uh, this is a recent paper published just this year from a group in Wageningen. I, I think it's very interesting, and this is where big data really comes in. Uh, they're looking at resilience, resilience. And the question is, how quickly does a cow recover from a perturbation that causes some change in her productivity. And this line shows, or these three lines, one is a standardized uh, milk lactation curve line. And that, that has to be standardized for the herd and actually for the cow uh, in order to, to make this work. But you can see there are two deviations from this line. There's a black line and a gray line. And notice how the one cow takes a lot longer to get back to normal when something happens. So that is defined as lower resilience. Whereas the little black line, it stays almost on the curve all the time. And so that's higher resilience. And in this paper, they not only talk about doing this in cattle, in dairy cattle, but they talk about doing it in pigs, sort of on a litter basis or on a sire basis. And so maybe we could do this kind of thing on bulls. What kind of resilience do their daughters have? And I think this is an interesting concept that we could use now and use in the future. And if you haven't seen this paper, it's a, it's a pretty interesting paper. I think it's a, a, a good idea. The folks in Wageningen have some, some good thinking, good ideas. The other thing is that we can do in the future, I'm sure that we'll be doing, is breeding in the test tube. So rather than taking several years to go through generations, two years to go through a generation, we may take a week to go through a generation in the test tube. And when we talk about potential of creating lines, we could do this. Now, this is pretty artificial, but we start out with stem cells from an embryo. And then we treat those stem cells with certain growth factors or certain hormones so that some of them become oogonia and some become spermatogonia. And then we treat those with mitotic factors and meiotic factors so that they reach a point in meiosis where we can put those, maybe artificially put those cells together, do a genomic test on them, and then go the next generation. Uh, the Chinese have already published half of this in mice. It's already been done. 
So in theory, if you could do it in mice, there's no reason why we can't do it in cattle. But this was give us some tools to sort out things in the lab before we actually go to the real world. And so this might help us develop lines or, or groups of cattle that are disease resistant, for example. If, if we wanted foot and mouth disease resistant cattle, maybe this is a system that we use to incorporate those genes and test them to see if they're there. And so the opportunity to do that in the future, the plant people have been doing this for some time in some ways, but the opportunity, I think, to do breeding in the test tube is a great opportunity for us genetically and understanding what's going on at the RNA level and the genome level, transcriptome level uh, in the future. So uh, that's a great opportunity. Here's a, here's a final slide with Drosophila. I don't think you can read that from the back, so let me just tell you what they did. Drosophila are fruit flies. They feed them in the lab. They grew, took a group of male Drosophila who were producing offspring by mating to females, and they fed them high levels of sugar and mated them to females, and then they went back to normal levels of sugar. The sons of those males that received high levels of sugar were obese. So I wonder, could we change the cows in our herds by changing the way we feed the bulls in the bull studs. In theory, they have induced epigenetic changes in the sperm. And in fact, they demonstrate they developed, epi did epigenetic changes in the sperm by what they fed the males. And I don't know whether we've ever thought about doing that in our bull studs or not, but what if we could make healthier calves by simply feeding the bulls in the stud differently? Those are kind of things I think that we need to incorporate into our thinking, uh, our thinking in the future. Finally, I mentioned microbiome. The microbiome is going to be real important in the future. We think the microbiome of a calf is established at birth by microorganisms that it obtains from the reproductive tract of the mother as it's delivered and by the organisms that are in the colostrum. Now, if we understood what those beneficial organisms are, maybe we add those microbes to the colostrum so that we inoculate the calf's microbiome at birth. There's some data, again, from Israel that says that's much more important than the diet, the rumen diet, the rumen function, the rumen organisms is much more independent of diet than we think it has been in the past. And so manipulating the microbiome on the farm in the animal is going to be a whole new venture for us. It's in, and the genomics of that is going to be important for us. We're going to see that move much more quickly. There's lots and lots of research going on in that area. We'll have products, microbiomic products with genetic labels on them, certainly in the next 10 years, maybe in the next five years. And we'll be using that agronomically. We already are. We'll use it on the farmstead. Some cow specific, we may have a robot on the farm that feeds individual cows certain microbes that they need. And so we'll be able to use technology to do that. And even some will be therapeutically used in the future. So that's sort of my ideas of, uh, uh, of the future. I, and we say reaching for the future, if you can envision it, you can create it. And that's really what I believe that we should be trying to do. So thank you for the opportunity to visit with you this morning.